Hello and welcome to Liberty Law Talk. I'm your host, Richard Reinch. Liberty Law Talk is featured at the online journal Law and Liberty, which is available at lawliberty.org. Today we're talking with Amity Schles about her new book, Great Society, A New History. Amity is the author of four New York Times bestsellers, The Forgotten Man, A New History of the Great Depression, The Greedy Hand, How Taxes Drive Americans Crazy, and a biography of Calvin Coolidge entitled Coolidge, which she appeared on this program, one of our first uh, podcasters when we started this program. So, Amity, glad to welcome you back. And uh, the book has been getting a lot of attention, a lot of reviews from what I can tell. So congratulations. Well, thank you. Glad to be back. All right. So tell me or tell us, sketch for us, uh, what was the Great Society? I think if you start with where we are now, a whole lot of idealism from young people, a generational divide. Young people don't think older people appreciate their concerns. You talking to boomers, that's the way it felt in the early 60s. So my book is about idealists who were young, some socialists, some idealistic, some capitalists. And what they wanted to do um, to make their society not just good, but superlative, great. Uh, and it, this was a common goal. Um, and it, so that's the early 60s. The Great Society was also a program. But the ultimate question is, how do you get to great? Do you get to great by the public sector or the private sector? And over and over again, we chose the public sector as our vehicle and tool. It didn't work out. So the Great Societies was a 1960s program that foreshadowed all the programs we are suggesting now. And we can also see its results. And they were ranging from suboptimal to horrible. You start, I mean, when I think about the Great Society, I always, and I've read it a few times, I think about President Johnson's commencement address, 1964, at the University of Michigan, where he issues the call and and he says, we will build a great society. And I also think about his speech. I think it was a year later. You talk about it at Howard university, uh, you know, the, in, in the famous metaphor of life is a race. And because of the, the way blacks have been treated in America, the race wasn't fair and this necessitated government intervention, but you, you don't necessarily start there. You start with the show Bonanza and you start with the Port Huron statement of 1962. Why? Well, Bonanza was a very popular show that commenced in the 60s, and it really wasn't just about going somewhere as a lone cowboy, uh, I don't know, winning the girl or killing the bad guy or rounding him up, corralling him. It, It was a cowboy show of a new genre. It was a cowboy show about what you do once you've settled in a community and you already are rich. It was a cowboy show about what to do with money and how to behave. So... Um, on Ponderosa, the family are always trying, on their ranch, they're always trying to um, show others how to behave, to civilize the main street of the frontier town. And that was different, and it really did reflect the 60s, the Bonanza thesis, the Bonanza subjects, which were how, how do we share wealth and how do we build civilization and make it better or great. So that's why I started with Bonanza. The book also ends with Bonanza. Bonanza was an iconic show. Um, it was extremely popular. Um, and uh, another um, reason it's important is the word bonanza. In the early 60s, most Americans thought that w- to be rich was our God-given right, and the wealth just came from somewhere, a cornucopia or bonanza, and they took it for granted. They focused on the redistribution of it or uh, you know, uh, the perpetuation of it, but they, they took it for granted. And what the book shows is that wealth and growth are not to be taken for granted, uh, that you can slow growth through government policy or individual behavior. So, so Bonanza is the theme throughout. It, it, it suggests that an emphasis on redistribution is probably ill-advised because then you have less to redistribute. So <clears throat> it was interesting, too, as I was reading that chapter and thinking about, so the confidence, and you use that word in the introduction, that, that confidence drives uh, this period, drives the policy-making period. Uh, 
the reaction. You talk about Michael. Could you, <clears throat> could you repeat that word? Uh, confidence. Uh, what? Confidence. Confident. Yes, they were very confident, and that's. I think that's similar to now because people think. Well, that it's also our God-given right to see the Dow Jones Industrial Average or the S and P go up forever. Yes. Confident, right? It, it, it's the money's there. The dollar is king, no matter what we do. So that's that's very interesting, and that that the contrast. Too. The contrast, asked, though, would be with uh, your earlier work, uh, Coolidge, because you note that Coolidge begins with with thinking, uh, and his family begins with thinking intensively about not not wealth, but the absence of it, and how. You know, one could, um, you know, in, in grasping for it, uh, come into ruin through debt. And so you thought about frugality, you thought about work, you, you thought about careful living. And yet now we're in this period where riches themselves seem to have overwhelmed that more, uh, I'll say, virtuous or realistic concern. Yes. Coolidge, Coolidge was the cautious man. Um, he didn't believe you should leverage, your, you should leverage yourself to the hilt. He didn't believe in taking an unnecessary risk in any area of life, not not just materially. Uh, he believed in holding back, given the choice between a possible good and doing nothing. Uh, he would sometimes do nothing because he would say, with the possible good may come an unknown bad. Rather interesting. In the 60s, um, let's go back to the 20s. So in the 20s, there was a sense that America had to earn its status as superpower. It was a temporary acting superpower at the end of World War One, but its predominance was not assured or rated as necessarily permanent. It wanted to become the permanent superpower. So Coolidge and his Treasury Secretary Mellon pursued policies to that end, which included balancing the budget. Any day, the dollar could go down and sterling could go up. That sterling had been the predominant currency in the 19th century. Why shouldn't it be again? If if our policy was too foolish, were too foolish, then England would prevail and our dollar would lose. So, so Coolidge was protective, prophylactic, cautious. Um, and then I do cover the 1930s in Forgotten Men, and in Forgotten Men you have a call to a collective effort by Franklin Roosevelt and even Herbert Hoover before him, and that call is different because it's in the face of want. One in four men was unemployed in 1932. Here we have something in the 60s much more similar to today. We're all doing pretty well, but we're not happy with all the results. We want to go from good to great. Uh, so this period is unusual in that um, we, we feel super rich. I'm trying to think of another mm. period like it. Uh, but we feel we feel pretty rich. We just feel everything isn't quite fair. Yeah, which is different from people are starving. You can argue people are starving, but it's hard to make that argument um, today. Think, so, thinking about something, some, I, some attempt it. Something that I brought up earlier. So, so say the maybe the the, the wealthiest generation in American history, the Boomers. Uh, I guess it would be early Boomers uh, who drafted the Port Huron Statement, um, 1962. You include that in the second chapter as a way of thinking about the great society. Um, but what's the connection there? Well, we're speaking of idealism. So the kind of Earth Day or Woke Day or Global Warming Day that you would have now was a historic meeting on Lake Huron, Port, in Port Huron, which happened also, by the way, to be the um, childhood dwelling of Thomas Edison. Anyway, um, in this otherwise unknown town, a bunch of students came together. And this is a mythical story and wrote a manifesto. And this is a mythical story, I think, you know, in, in popular cinema, there are references to the Port Huron Statement. Um, I participated in the Port Huron Statement. I was there because the people who attended, some became legendary later. And the statement itself, when you look at it, is kind of benign and rambling. It looks like a C-grade essay. Um, undergraduate say paper about the future rambles all over the place has a few good ideas but not coherent and it was written by a group um, nonetheless some of those people went on to basically this was at the time of the formation of students for a democratic society Tom Hayden um, one of the leaders of the group went on into the violent period of SES and the yippies and so on so 
this is where it got its start in a kind of benign student meeting. Um, these were all students, activists coming from across the country in their little cars, uh, it, talking about this and that, really trivial stuff like uh, the rule, what time a boy must leave a girl's dormitory. Remember, this is the early 60s, mm. not the late 60s, at night, and what universities could tell students going over to the most almost uh, so vague as to be un meaningless topics such as um, what do we do in the machine age? What's mm. wrong? And uh, I tried to describe this because this was the left idealism. Um, basically, there were some libertarians, but it was the left idealism. And what's interesting is um, the attendees didn't imagine they'd get anywhere, and yet pretty soon some of their ideas were being implemented as policy by the Johnson administration. It was sort of an accident, but the Johnson administration did head left after Kennedy. So Michael Harrington, a socialist who's one of the characters, actually got into the office that formed the new poverty law, the Office of Economic Opportunity. He worked with Sergeant Schreiber, the poverty czar of the period. Mm -hmm. So they went from sort of meaningless, goofy students to meaningful participants in society in the 60s very fast. And the surprise for me in writing this, those students went there and I always thought they were all very independent, you know, and they got together and this was away from the establishment. That was the point. What I learned in the research for this book about poor Huron, imagine dumpy cabins by a lake with students staying up all night smoking, writing paragraphs and reading them to each other, um, was that the event was more or less funded by organized labor. The camp itself, Port Huron, which is also called Four Freedoms after Roosevelt, was owned by organized labor. And how did this all happen? The University of Michigan is in Michigan, where the UAW, the mighty, mighty United Auto Workers, were one of the Michigan undergrads. Uh, a young lady named Sharon Jeffrey was the daughter of the aide-de-camp of Walter Ruther, the head of the UAW. And you can imagine this from the point of view of the UAW. They say, well, a lot of people seem to be going to college these days. We're an industrial union, but we appreciate college, and we certainly want 10 million people's worth of union dues to flow into our coffers, and we want to be the future. We don't want to be just a bunch of has-been old workers. We want to capture the young generation. So we'll will lightly fund a student movement. Uh, that was the thing. You know, and yeah. uh, they were to be, and if they, if they had the wrong ideas, because the, uh, the UAW and the AFL-CIO at that time were not communists. They were bitter enemies of the Soviet Union and the Soviet regime, but they had social slash social democratic ideals. Yeah. And one of the problems with these young people, one of the early fights, was that the Port Huron statement was insufficiently anti-Soviet for the union's taste. Okay. And they don't, you know, they just didn't want to get in trouble either. So you imagine this whole thing. Um, they're funding these young people. They're they're giving them a long leash. I, I tweeted um, one check that went out to pay for Tom Hayden, the legendary yes. progressive left leader. And uh, I just didn't realize uh, until I researched in, in the Wayne State Library and so on to what extent the union funded the student movement and what a, what a kind of um, frustration that must have been because the left student movement handed the 1968 election to Richard Nixon, who, who hated labor, more or less. So the unions who funded the young student movement hurt themselves through this funding in the bitterest of fashion than they, the union leaders, such as Luther felt. No, no. Furious. They felt totally betrayed by the students. No, that, the unintended consequences. You, uh, that, that Another, also. Another, uh, first example of unintended no, consequences. First example yes. of unintended consequences. So, and, and I do want to ask you about these, these, these persons. We, we've mentioned a few already, but I also want to get your perspective on what encompasses the great society. I mean, you, you talk about the war on poverty in the book, you talk about the housing policies and then sort of this domestic policy front. But what else I mean, should we include the space uh, exploration program? <clears throat> should we include the Vietnam um, war? I mean, how, know, how should we cabin all this? Well, Johnson defined it classrooms, countryside cities. Those were his three areas for great society at that Michigan speech. 
where Walter Ruther was there at the end to thank him for giving it, by the way. Um, and that, so they were going to have efforts to improve education. And we have a number of laws, some of which help create our student debt problem. Um, university funding, um, K through 12 funding that came out of the Great Society. Cities, the, the very first component was something the, called the Office of Economic Opportunity, which was the poverty obliteration office led by poverty czar Sarge Shriver. Um, countryside, there was a program, um, a hillbilly elegy program, we would say, okay. um, call on, on funding Appalachia and the extreme poverty there. Michael Harrington, the author, had written a book called The Other America about poverty, and he um, had great thoughts about Appalachia. So um, Johnson promised to cure poverty, not to create a palliative, but to cure it. To cure so that's it. interesting. Um, and then, like any project, Great Society or any um, Great Society morphed. And one of my theses is that Nixon, a Republican, whom we would expect to be different and was different in attitude, actually ended it for political reasons up continuing the Great Society. For example, he expanded uh, or permitted the, ex the vast expansion of food stamps. So it was just a, lot, a bigger state. Um, I think you're asking about civil rights, and what's interesting there, and you you really picked it up, is at first the Great Society was about equality of opportunity. That's pretty clear. That didn't seem enough to Johnson, so he asked after Michigan at Howard U in another mm -hmm. commencement speech for equality of result. Yeah, that was an official call for. A lot of programs we know of now, whether in business or affirmative action or, 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 and that was a shift with which everyone was not comfortable. So you have a society where in 1961, when he's being inaugurated, Kennedy says, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country to, we've got to help everyone. We owe you, which is what it became by 1966 or 67. Um, and later in the period, you know, the courts cooperated very much. For example, there's a Supreme Court case I described called Goldberg v. Kelly yeah. that basically said welfare is property. It's your money and you are super entitled to it, not just nice. entitled. It's property like a patent that you wrote when you had an invention. Um, so you have a complete switch in what's asked of individuals in their society. Within ten years, it's dramatic. Is it also you know thinking about and I suppose Vietnam? You talk some about McNamara, just even the way that war was uh, fought at times, sort of the uh, technocratic approach to it. Uh, that somehow um, there was a strategy and a way to pursue it without actually, you know, it, it being uh, fighting a typical war of holding ground or removing the enemy, but you could conceive of it. Uh, I guess more in a more tactical, precise way. It seems to me, and, and I've never thought about it in that regard, but it seems to be also sort of part of this entire mindset uh, that you're describing in the book. Yeah, well, well. There's, so yeah. there's there's um the best and the brightest the was and the brightest, this book by yeah. David Halverson that showed what fools the uh, planners of the Vietnam War were, and Max Boot has written about this very persuasively too. You know, McNamara had an idea about bombing and how it might work that didn't correlate to reality. It just correlated to his spreadsheets. Yeah. Uh, and that was part of the insanity of Vietnam. Um, here he was fighting against guerrillas as if they were the, I don't know, the German army with tanks. And I always thought, well, the best and brightest, that was about foreign policy. But what you discover when you look is we had the same high appreciation of intelligence, technocracy, and planning, long-live consultants, long-live business school graduates in domestic policy. And some of the characters carry over. Um, McGeorge Bundy, McNamara, who after being defense secretary, failing as defense secretary, went over and was equally foolish um, and also tragic in his, in his result at the World Bank. Um, and one thing McNamara <laughs> did gives you a good idea. I noticed this because they just blew my mind. Um, no, no respect for 
some other space, whether it's the local space, the regional space, the state space, the space of, of faith, no respect for any of that. So McNamara, because he was a numbers person, figured out that if there were fewer people, maybe more resources would be available. That was his answer to scarcity. And he <laughs> went, and so he was for zero population. Okay, whatever. Um, and there were others like that. But he, where did he choose to give a, a deliver an address on this? At Notre Dame. Yeah. So yeah. that's kind of insult that you, you have to work hard. Yeah. I, I mean, it takes a lot of talent to be that insulting. And he was. To be that arrogant. And, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and that, well, that arrogant and that insulting to not see what damage he might do, what offense he might bring, what, you know, by arguing for birth control or zero population in front of the Catholic Church. Of course, you know, that's not the only example, but it, he's kind of almost like Asperger y, people who uh -huh. like diagnoses now. It, he, he did not, he was so smart, he did not pick up stuff. And the tragic <laughs> part was, he was so smart, the government used and applied his policies, or the World Bank did. So you think of um, something like the sterilization of men in India. That came out of the mindset that McNamara shared. Yeah. Less people, better. We redistribute resources, and resources can't really grow because, by the way, we're socialists, right? So yeah. we, slow, we slow production. It, it was one of the saddest things ever, and uh, Julian Simon and Paul Ehrlich are also characters. Those were the two opponents, one who believed that the world would run out of everything, Ehrlich, and the other, Simon, that uh, growth would make life uh, quite pleasant and more efficient in the future. And, of course, mathematically, Simon won that bet. But in the time of my book, of Great Society, it looked like Ehrlich might. Okay. And there was also something yeah. called the Club of Rome. The Club of Rome. That believed in zero. And it's all, it all, it, I guess it shows that first you aim for great, then you become profoundly pessimistic. So now let me ask you this. We've been talking about sort of the intellectual architecture of the great society. A criticism of your book in the New York Times earlier this week, I think, Benjamin Applebaum, said, why didn't you include in your book more of a description of Medicare, Medicaid, food stamps, and Head Start, if I've got it all? which he says were enormously beneficial parts of the great society. And I'm curious what your response is. Well, I tried to do the book in real time. Mm. And if you imagine to write the way they felt, and then we know what the consequences are, right? So, so what were they thinking to create a giant program like Medicare, which is worse in terms of our obligations and its shortfalls than social security, which we tend to think is the biggest program of all. Yeah. Well, at the time, and this is another example of unintended consequences, I don't think they thought that much. Here's what was in Johnson's mind, and you can see that because he went to sign the health care amendments. They were amendments to Social Security um, with Harry Truman, who had failed, failed to get through some form of nationalized health care in the past. He wanted to honor Truman and say, I'm doing what, 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 something of what you thought health care for seniors and poor people, but it, basically uh, Johnson wanted to honor Truman and bolster his party, one. Two, the war was on and Johnson wanted to throw poor and old people a really good bone because hundreds of thousands of young men were going very suddenly to Southeast Asia and some dying there. Three, he never imagined they would be as big as they are. So um, I think the New York Times Review by Benjamin Applebaum was a little um, Whig version of history. That is, it's looking back with more knowledge than we had at the time. In Johnson's time, old men were dead by the time they were 70. Yeah. They didn't live till That's they were That's how the welfare 90. state works. Johnson himself, <laughs> right. Yeah. So Medicare would work if everyone died very early, right? <laughs> and Medicaid would work if the war on poverty were won because there would be no poor, poor people to claim Medicare. So this is another... Um, example in my mind of a real unintended consequence yeah you one of the amusing characters and and for me to say yeah. and they were wrong and it was the centerpiece of the great society is to misrepresent what they thought at the time well and i thought um and I, yeah i mean and i thought on. as well that is there is there something new about I me mean, maybe with head start but is there something new about those proposals or as just being sort of long-standing goals behind the creation of a welfare state Versus what I take you to be arguing the Great Society, that there's this policy innovation, federal government power thing going on that drives 
the Great Society. Like, right. like I mean, Sergeant Shriver, uh, which as I, as I read, I didn't, I've never read much about him until your book. And he really is an example of uh, someone who, who means well. I mean, it just seems like he's fundamentally believes in what he's doing in national service and helping the poor and is producing all manner well, he's, of, of he's untoward an outcomes. Argument, uh, you know, he's an argument against social conservatism in politics because he really wasn't a lefty. What he was saying was, we must get things done that we normally do with the church, such as encourage marriage and help poor people by giving out alms. That can translate to government. The government is just a bigger charity office, or it should be, and certainly we can afford that it might be. Therefore, I will do what I do in my church at home from an office in Washington 10,000 times larger. It didn't work because you are cut off from your community because the federal government really can't direct people to give up poverty, poverty and adapt a, adopt a work ethic. It cannot direct how people marry or don't. Um, it's just ill-equipped for that even now. So if you're a left conservative, sorry, if you're a left big government person or a right one, you can take some, some sad lessons from Sergeant Shriver. He was such a nice man. And, um, you know, you think his wife, well, they did the Peace Corps. He did that. His wife did Special Olympics. And he did Great Society. Which do we like the best? Personally, I like Special Olympics. Yeah, yeah no, we do. Um, uh, you know, because it's, it's about what you could do if you try. Um, the Peace Corps uh, sounds nice, but is often terrifyingly naive um, and sometimes hurts the places it aims to help. And the poverty office... Shriver was sort of foist into the job by Johnson, um, had so many perverse outcomes and not at all what he was intended. And it kind of ruined his career um, because Johnson, being an opportunistic rat thing, uh, abandoned Shriver um, and shipped him off to Paris to lick his wounds. So the war on poverty fails. And just in general, an idea of domestic policy as a war is incredibly dangerous. Seems I mean, there's a, there's this, this, a limit to what domestic policy can do. Yeah, it, 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 and there in the book, what they, I try to give a sense is they tried, they failed with one thing. So they tried another thing, got failed. So they tried another thing, and each time, in some way or other, the the new wave was more grandiose. It was always more, more, more. So the housing bill cost more than the poverty bill because it came later, um, and the and so on. You know, there's just more, 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 and even more did not help or take you closer to great. So and maybe we're talking about this generally. Talk about the, the sources of the unexpected tragedies of the Great Society. I think you're, you're I, I was talking to some people, your chapter on housing, I thought was just, it left me truly sad uh, and thinking about what had been achieved uh, or what had been not achieved, but really destroyed well, by housing policies. Well, you yeah. know, the book's about planning, so it actually starts in the 50s, where our first urban blight yeah. ambition toward great involved housing. Uh, and we had urban renewal, which was premised on the idea that you should um, bulldoze whole areas of downtown and build um, utopian housing, hopefully in the international school, for poor people. And what that did was uproot poor people who might not have loved their tenement but may have felt some connection to it and certainly chose which tenement they lived in, within their ghetto at least, um, and put them all willy-nilly, more or less, in tall skyscrapers and insisted that the fathers in the families stay away uh, because the families wouldn't get welfare benefits or be entitled and, to live in such And inspected. And, and you know, I never, that was truly harrowing. Social workers inspecting to see if fathers were there. Yeah, some of that's <laughs> state law. Yeah. Um, because state is in charge of writing of welfare it. specifics often. Yeah, and in in the the uh, institution that I profile is the housing project, the largest, called pruitt Igo in St. Louis. And there were a few premises, additional premises to pruitt Igo. One was um, that St. Louis would always grow. So if they packed these buildings dense enough, eventually people would move from poverty into 
working class and would be able to pay the rent. And if there were enough of them, the housing projects could support the poor and be going concerns. Well, the growth stayed away. That, and so the simple arithmetic of the solvency of Pruitt Igo just didn't work. There was way too much vacancy. And then uh, bad gangs moved into the empty apartments or took over the halls. And there were too few tenants, too few working tenants and very few men to fight back. So it was teenage boys and moms, what's become a sad cliche, right? So, so that's what went on. And, and over and over again in the 60s, including um, with Sergeant Shriver and actually um, Romney, the George Romney, George the Romney. father of Mitt, who was housing secretary, they tried to fix Pruitt Igo. And the idea was always build something big or bigger. Cars are important. Street, uh, pedestrian zone is not important. Um, and we know what we're doing. And it, this is so much of a piece with the bombing of North Vietnam, right? It, it's sort of like the, you know, yeah. it's very similar uh, bird's eye view of, a very specific place, and in um, the case of Pruitt Igo, and what, what I what I argue is, big housing is not a good idea. Sometimes small housing started by locals is much better. And the person I bring in here, who economists don't normally bring in, um, but I think um, she is the prophetess. It was is is was Jane Jacobs, yeah. who in New York uh, protected Greenwich Village from the highway builder. The housing and highway czar, the infrastructure czar, Robert Moses. And she said, wait a minute, my street might seem tacky. It might be blighted. You could condemn it under Berman v. Parker, the Supreme Court decision. But I think it can unslum. I think it's on its way to unslumming because people here like it. it yeah. So she she talked a lot about that and she talked about the importance of architecture and houses with eyes the international school might be fashionable again now but it's it's just profoundly isolating in terms of mentality you know it's really collectivist it's not forgiving it's not everyone his own window it's a common space um, and internet you know modern architecture was a disaster in terms of poor people because it isolated them in tall buildings and put parks around with no commerce and Jane Jacobs, uh, The Death and Life of American Cities, is still a prophetic book, very easy to read, by the way. I recommend it, the audio, yeah. about how neighborhoods can cure themselves and how you actually are doing malpractice surgery when you roll highways through. Not everyone likes cars. Even re some Republicans are pedestrians by nature. You know, yeah. you know when we talk about this, it, it, I always hear from Republicans, Republicans like cars. I don't believe that. I think some people are car people and some people are go on foot people and they're from both parties. Anyway, Jane Jacobs wasn't of a party. She was really independent and very much opposed to the war, by the way. But she's this little lady, a uh, very good architectural journalist, but just one lady who led the fight against Moses and really the fight against the Great Society housing. I want to mention one other thing. There was a, a complete hypocrisy in terms of housing policy in the United States subsequent to World War II and um, amplified in the Great Society period, the 60s period. On the one hand, for the middle class people, we had the kind of Tocqueville policy, which is you go to a town, we'll subsidize your house if you're a veteran or in some other way through Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, and you'll get a house and you'll become part of a community and your children will play with the other children in the cul-de-sac and you will go to church together. That's yeah. kind of the, yeah. the middle-class subsidy vision. So the middle-class people get Tocqueville. The poor people get Karl Marx. You will live in a tall building in a city <laughs> and then as an anonymous worker, you will get into an anonymous pram or something like that and ride to your factory, which, by the way, hasn't materialized. Because that's what workers like. And you have to ask yourself, what would have happened if we had done Tocqueville for poor people as well? This, this idea dawned on uh, planners <laughs> by yeah. the end of the 60s. And you see that led by Chuck Percy, the senior senator from Illinois. And um, by some people whose names we know, such as Chris Demuth and John McLowry, um, they worked on housing policy that would help enable poor people to buy homes and get property. So the real debate for us is, do we think property is necessary in the Tocqueville vision? And I would say absolutely. I don't believe 
renting or defensible space suffices unless you're in a very strong community where, you know, uh, a religious community, say, where the, the management, the leader of the church rents. I believe individuals should own their property. Jane Jacobs didn't go that far, um, but her data did. And it, the real tragedy was that we condescended to poor people with this tacky, ill-thought-out Marxist policy in terms of housing. You make, I mean, I mean, I guess I, listening to you, I was thinking about which a lot of conservatives rejected during later in the Obama administration. I don't know if this would be an example of that, whereby it was proposed policies of moving, say, urban poor out of inner cities or downtown cities and moving them into out into suburbs, surrounding suburbs. Um, uh, I wonder if that's maybe an example. Um, thinking about uh, this, you also noted like the Detroit riot that it started at the yeah, epicenter that's, that's of where people there. had been relocated uh, once their neighborhood had been destroyed. Uh, that, that, that right. Sort of There's that. a wonderful yeah. book. I mean, you're saying that the Obama administration recommended moving poor people out of cities? Out of cities. and into out, The recommendation was that. I, I, I think Ben Carson canceled it. Uh, but the idea was you had to yeah, move them well, into surrounding, I mean, surrounding towns, um, and into homes, uh, yeah, things like that. Uh, but I mean, I'm not an expert and, on the policy. Them, uh, well, what we do have a policy now. We have basically rental vouchers, which came out of this period, which gives people more choice. You yeah. know, yeah. they can take their money and go look for housing yeah. that will accept their vouchers, and the government makes sure there is such housing. But the idea of moving people on group outside of cities is crazy. I mean. Well, the cynicism there, too, is uh, it, then you would move wealthy people a, probably back into the land they left, and you would have... You move, uh, right, yeah. so they move them to some safe place like Ferguson, Missouri. Right, where, right, right. Yeah. Uh, right, right. That's really safe for Michael Brown. You know, um, this yeah. is the young man who was shot in Ferguson. It, you know, uh, misery doesn't care where it lives, and sometimes misery does better in the city. Yeah. Um, so... There you are. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, yeah. I don't think suburbs are any better or worse. Um, sometimes they're worse because you need a car. So, so there we are. Yeah, you certainly like need a car here in Another question? <laughs> no, I was thinking. Well, yeah. The Watt, Watts in Detroit. So we have uh, we have the Great Society programs being implemented, and then we get the riots. You have a chapter uh, on these events, and and mayors in your book, report being very fearful of, of protest and riots breaking out in Los Angeles and other cities uh, throughout the country, and, and yet we're on the cusp of this vast uh, revolutionary pro-government change. Well, the standard history of the period is that there was nothing, and then the federal government came along and did something right. for poverty, and what that history overlooks is the entire tradition of towns dealing with poverty in their towns, that was the scope of the town, the municipal authority, or maybe state, as we discussed, um, but not really a federal job. So when the Johnson administration came through, um, it, it sent sort of virtual bulldozers to run over policies of mayors and towns. And you know what? The mayors were elected to take care of the town. So they had a reasonable claim to authority here. And um, I always learned that Mayor Daley of Chicago was a corrupt creep, right? Mm -hmm. And that Mayor Yorty of Los Angeles didn't care about poor people. And none of this was true. What happened was you have a jurisdictional clash. The mayors had poverty programs, and if they were Democrats, they expected to get federal money for them. They had helped to elect Johnson. They deserved poverty money. They had a poverty office. Mayor Daley took all his poverty ideas and put them in a big box and mailed them. So the poverties are, here's what Chicago is, uh, uh, what your appropriation should be for. My Chicago plan, yours, Richard J. Daly. But Sergeant Shriver and the administration, that would be the Johnson administration, didn't think that way. They wanted their own poverty programs. They wanted to be like the Peace Corps going in, ignoring all mm. jurisdictions, all government, all past church, everything, and do their own thing. And so there was a real clash. And in the case of Los Angeles, it, it, this is kind of a, a defense of federalism. It's a federalist uprising by the mayors. Um, but in the fight, Los Angeles 
didn't get the money Mayor Sam Yorty was expecting to get, and he had promised a lot of jobs to young people over the summer. And the fight between Mayor Yorty, who wasn't wrong, and the federal government, who, which was more wrong but not entirely, um, delayed help for Los Angeles, froze the city, and contributed to the uh, explosive environment in which the Watts riot occurred. If you, you mm, it's okay. not as though what what happened was Yordi said there will be jobs paid for by the federal government. We will give you a great summer. I'm not saying I approve of that that the government does that, but he established that expectation among the citizens of Los Angeles. And then when the 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 presence did not materialize, the people were all the more became all the more cynical and angry. In Detroit what happened is slightly different. Um, that was later. In Detroit, the one reason there was so much anger in Detroit was th- that uh, sort of delayed, built-up anger over urban renewal. Um, the the whole community there was still angry over being displaced, uh, uh, their favorite streets being mowed over by these bulldozers. And uh, the newspapers commented that at the time. Mixed in there is... Um, the selective service going to Vietnam, yeah. you know, um, the industri- the the switch to higher skill jobs that come as comes as the economy develops. You know, muscles. Uh, there was less of a premium on muscles and more of a premium on training or thought, even in the 1960s than it had been in the 40s. So, what's going to happen? Um, but yeah. these were all factors. Thinking about you, you know, I lo- go ahead. I was just going to say I ended up liking the mayors. Okay. These mayors who were, I was always told, were so awful. That's like, well, they're like, we don't want any Marxists coming in our city. We have our own poverty plan, and here it is. Uh, David Beto has written a wonderful book, which I'm sure you mentioned um, on oh, your yeah. show called Mutual Aid in the Welfare State, yes. about all the, all the places and services that existed in a kind of incomplete but rather extensive patchwork across the country that was Tocqueville's America. So you'd have the Italian American burial service, the Irish American family insurance, the church. It didn't mean everyone was always taken care of, but a lot of people were, and there was a plus because it was by the community. Effectively, a community can always serve its people better than someone far away. It's very rare for someone far away to guess that your school needs a gym not a computer, it, it, you know, it, and you think a gym would be more important because you happen to have 20 computers. Someone in Washington is terrible at judging that. So there are very few examples. In the book, I kind of make the call that if 8% of the people who are black can vote in Mississippi, there's something wrong with that. More of the people in Mississippi who are black should be able to vote. So maybe the Voting Rights Act and, the, you know, the Civil Rights Act um, uh, yeah. were necessary, but not the laws after that. Uh, you know, uh, you know that's, that's an interesting statistic. I'm from the South. Uh, for, uh, 40% of blacks in the South were registered to vote. Mississippi an outlier, I think, yeah, 8%. But only 60% of whites were registered to vote. <laughs> that was the comparison oh, there is sort of interesting. Yeah. Um, thinking here also, you know, the Great Society spreads across the Kennedy, Johnson, and also the Nixon administration. When we get to the Nixon administration, Daniel Patrick Moynihan emerges, and the family, what comes to be called the Family Assistance Plan, and guarantee, something like a guaranteed income, which is now in vogue uh, again. Uh, but we get a forerunner of that, a taste. Um, and then, and you know, Moynihan loses a lot of these uh, battles. But how does this, because this seemed to me part of your book that I thought very relevant, and in particular the discussion of this Disraeli this Benjamin Disraeli idea of conservatism, uh, of sort of a, you know, a one nation conservatism, a conservative party that also serves the working class with policies, et cetera, et cetera. And so that's how Nixon really continues in many ways, the great society among other, among other ways. Yes. Nixon was a conservative who continued the great society. I don't, I don't think that reflected well on him, unfortunately, in the end. Um, he, it, what happened with Moynihan, very current, similar to the guaranteed income idea you're hearing about now, was conservatives and 
progressives got together and said, this idea of providing services to the poor people hasn't worked out. We're feeding the horses to feed the sparrows, the horses being the welfare workers. That is, the bureaucratic establishment to serve the poor gets more out of our programs than do the actual poor. So let's give the poor money. That seems more honest. And uh, that idea has a great appeal today. In, in, in Friedman's concept, this was what's called a negative income tax, where you get money back for working so you don't lose a lot when you start working. Moynihan had a very brave and bold effort uh, to do something like this, also for the working class, not just the poor. So for whites and blacks who are poor, not poor, um, he was going to do this, but he didn't do the arithmetic very well because what happens when you give people money back at the bottom is pretty soon they have an income that be, where they lose benefits. Yeah. Uh, that is their disincentive. Um, and the marginal cost of working harder is, is far greater than they expect. All of a sudden they lose their housing. Well, what's that worth? They lose four weeks. You know, they lose uh, Medicaid when they have too much money. And the arithmetic of figuring out which disincentives, which programs cost in the context of also supplying people with money is almost impossible to do. As Friedman said, probably we have to get rid of all payments in order for um, a universal payment, all you know, all other programs uh, to quote unquote work. I think the more profound argument against guaranteed income is it teaches people they're entitled. Yeah, that's a terrible thing to do for young people. That you're owed something every month. That is just that's what gave us the problem we have now: the infantilization of our society through a social democratic efforts through parents, through, you know, the health care program, and so on. People need to think they're independent and they earned money. So that that's why, that's what Congress, particularly the Senate, had against Moynihan's program. They said, we're some of us are Republicans, and some of us are Democrats, and some Democrats and many Republicans think that it's a bad precedent to just pay people money for existing. Uh, we've done too much of that, not too little, so let's cut back. And um, Moynihan's very interesting and lovable plan, because, again, paying people money does seem better than just um, well, it's like social, social security money. Failed. Yeah, yeah, it's like, it, it, it's, yeah, it's like social security for all. Yeah. Um, yeah. It, not, just, not just old people or disabled people at, or, or widows and orphans and so on. Um, and it was very expensive too. That's the other thing. And so, but but the senator said, "This is not particularly American. Let's not do it." And Moynihan lost, and he had to go back to. He was a great intellectual. This is before he was a senator. He went back to Cambridge, um, you know. And the war was part of the story too. Yeah, well, I will no, say the grandest kind of planning is at the end of the book, and I did want to get to that when you're ready. Yeah, no, and and we we can do that now. Then also, I was going to end with Reagan uh, because you you have a chapter on the governor from California, and and sort of mm-hmm. what do you think he's learning from this? And I think also you, your book sparks to my mind the questions he learns for governing as as, as governor of California as well, which uh, as you note in the book, uh, it's it's not just a recent thing. California has a long standing history of of being a powerful government and being dependent upon or interacting with the federal government. Uh, so maybe we can just end with all of that. Right. Well, let, um, let's say two things. One is what's the planning behind the planning? It's mm-hmm. economic Keynesianism, which says we can micromanage the economy through the Fed and the administration and maybe with Congress. You know, And it, it, there's a the fiction there, the pretense that Every twist and turn we can address. I mean, they used to have ideas such as uh, changing Social Security payments to be counter-cyclical. So when the economy needed a boost, you give more Social Security money. And when the economy didn't need a boost and you're afraid of inflation, or you were afraid of inflation, you give people less money. Can you imagine what kind of (laughs) um, abuse of trust that would feel like to a pensioner when they get a letter saying, this month your Social Security is less because the economy (laughs) needs it? to be lost to that money um, because otherwise, it, um, and of course, anyway, so they really thought they could manage the economy. This was the era of Keynes. It, um, and yeah. in the book, I tell the story about how 
um, even if that did work, it would be impossible because people are people and they're humans and they're political and no planner runs the U S alone. Like the wizard of Oz, you know, um, it, it's always a compromise. So the story I tell is of Richard Nixon, who's supposed to be a free marketeer imposing a terrible, um, economic program, the Camp David program in the yeah. summer of 1971, the so-called Nixon Chuck, uh, something worthy of, um, Juan Perón upon the United States in the name of winning re-election. And the uh, struggle in that case was between him and Arthur Burns, the Fed chairman, who knew better, uh, sort of uh, kind of recalls um, the president and Fed chairman Powell today, or also Johnson and William McChesney Martin, his Fed chair. Anyway, Nixon wanted to kill Burns if Burns wouldn't lower interest rates or lower them faster. He certainly wanted to kill Burns when Burns raised interest rates, and he tortured the Fed chairman um, to, up to the point where um, the White House had church services on Sunday. Burns, uh, Burns, one of Burns' weakness was that he was ethnically Jewish. I don't know if he was a religious Jew or not or what he thought his religion was, but he had a Jewish background. Okay. And um, Burns would go to these church services. Why? Because <laughs> you need access to the president if you're Fed chairman from time to time. And on the Friday night, Saturday night, before the church service at the White House, Nixon would get up one of his people, Haldeman or Ehrlichman, to call Burns and say, you're not invited to church because you've been a bad boy. <laughs> you, your, your monetary policy is too tight. And he even also went so far as to plant a smear of Burns in the Wall Street Journal, which I read about. But anyway, the net was Burns went along with a policy that gave us terrible inflation smaller houses, two fewer bedrooms than we otherwise would have had because of interest rates over 15% in the 80s. Those were the interest rates it took to suppress the inflation that Arthur Burns permitted because he wanted to stay friends with Richard Nixon. Yeah. Just like that. So the human error, human temperament, human weakness is a big part of the failings of the best and the brightest. McNamara was sad because President Johnson didn't like him, so he cuddled up with the Kennedys. That made Johnson dislike him even more. Therefore, his policy was very poor, and so on. It's, it's not just this, this fiction that there's one government running policy is, is indeed fiction. Usually it's a bunch of personalities with competing theories. And, and fiefdoms. You know, we all live, have to live with a compromised result, the perverse compromised result. Yeah, yeah. So... Reagan at the end here, he seems he's a part of your book and is learning uh, dramatically from what's going on. You, you see him as uh, I, I think someone who's you know, part of this opposition, uh, forming opposition to the great society program well, at, a, at an intellectual you know, and then a political level. Right. I mean, in a book, a book is, is like a novel, except you try to make the facts be facts. Um, and in a period, there's someone who's, uh, or like a, a drama, a theater play, there's someone who's in the chorus or who's the clown, as in Shakespeare, who is noticing what is going on and is a character who's halfway between audience and, and character. You know, he steps uh -huh. out from time to time and comments. A glooming yeah. piece this morning with it brings. You know, who is who is the commenter at the end of Romeo and Juliet? So, yeah. so there are two characters in the book who are like that. One is Moynihan, who gets, uh, you know, Nixon gets the better of him, unfortunately, because he was a nice man with a lot of original ideas and spoke truth to power. Um, and the other is Reagan. So Reagan starts out very low in the book, as it kind of has been. Um, and I do talk about his company, which is one of those companies, that did take the country to great General Electric. And at GE, um, Reagan learned all about free markets because GE had a kind of little propaganda mill to teach its workers that there was more to the world than Karl Marx and they could one day own three refrigerators and, you know, even, um, who knows what, a pink radio, a really good car. So they hired Reagan, who is a has-been actor, to learn all about capitalism and then to teach it at their plants over you know, in, in the cafeteria, practically, you know, not very glamorous, but he went around the country, spoke in hundreds and hundreds of banquet halls and lunchrooms about the merits of capitalism as a young uh, 
middle young to middle aged actor, not not really young. Uh, and he happened to kind of internalize the GE argument, which he learned from a forgotten figure named Lemuel Boulware. And also from books we know today that, that are in, um, you know, Liberty Phone Library, Hazlitt, yeah. Hayek, uh, and so on. Uh, and, you know, what was Reagan going to do with this? He parted ways not too happily with GE for a bunch of reasons, um, including GE's own hypocrisy. What's he going to do with it? Well, he decides he's going to try out politics, and he gives an important speech, a very Hayekian speech, Time for Choosing, yeah. in 1964 to support Barry Goldwater. It doesn't get Barry Goldwater elected, but it does show the country what Reagan can do. And then, um, as governor of California, he confronts the results of the Great Society, including, for example, gangsters in courtrooms shooting a judge. Yes. Or kind yeah. of, um, and he, or... Um, the Great Society office, the, the Poverty Czar's office, the Office of Economic Opportunity, sending lawyers to California on its time to sue Reagan, whose obligation, by the way, as governor is to balance the budget, to make it impossible for him to balance the budget with class actions demanding payments for people. So he kind of gets disgusted with the Great Society along with the country, and that shapes his uh, policy program, and that, that's the Reagan that we got someone who learned a bitter set of lessons from the Great Society. And I never really knew that. I never knew much about his gubernatorial period. Remember, too, that California is growing in that time, and it kind of didn't want to hear from New York. It's surpassing New York, right? Yeah. yeah. It's a, I call it the, cre- the, the creative society is what he does. He doesn't want a great society. He mm-hmm. uses the phrase creative yeah. Um, so it's the creative society versus the great. And he has a great appreciation, Reagan does, in this period of entrepreneurship, even though I have zero evidence he understood the potential of Silicon Valley. Um, well, yeah. He did generally appreciate entrepreneurship. Um, yeah. So well, uh, there we are. Well, th- thank you, Amity Schley, so much for your time. We've been discussing your new book, Great Society, A New History. I wish you every success. Oh, thank you. This is your host, Richard Greinch, and you have been listening to a podcast that can be found at libertylawsite.org, where you can subscribe, comment, and find other episodes and links related to today's conversation. Our email address is lal at libertyfund.org.